for me, it isn't really about finding what's next. Uh, it's not about finding the right industry. It's not even finding about what I'm passionate about. It's like, what can I do with my skills and my interests to make either the world better, my community better, the country better? What, what is it that I can do to help? And that's what, that's my, that's been my guiding star, you know, because I've got uh, various skills and tools. And so, you know, what should I be using those for? Alrighty, folks, welcome back to Transacting Value, where we're encouraging dialogue from different perspectives to unite over shared values. Our theme for 2022 is the character of your character. So who you see when you look your values in the mirror. Today, we're talking our October core values of vision, authenticity, and responsibility with Mr. Mark Havener, host of Not Another Business Podcast. Now, if you're new to the podcast, welcome. And if you're a continuing listener, then welcome back. Without further ado, folks, I'm Porter. I'm your host, and this is Transacting Value. All right, Mark, how you doing, man? I'm doing very well. Uh, very well, rested, ready for the week ahead. You know, that's that's more than some of us can say. It is a Sunday, so I'm going to need you to relax a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you caught me in the middle of furniture building, so this is a nice segue. Furniture building? What do you build? Yes. Oh, uh, you know, the, the stuff you get from Amazon to replace the fixture in your kitchen? I see. That's what I'm building uh, with the, okay. you know... Allen wrench, curious pets, the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I understand that. That's definitely not the top of my favorite things to do list. <laughs> uh, first of all, I do appreciate you coming onto the show and talking a little bit, you know, a values based conversation isn't really the highlight of family dinners. Uh, neither is character development in any real circle of friends, but uh, I appreciate it. So thank you. Absolutely. And I, I love the uh, the vision of this podcast. And it's really exciting to talk about this, especially in the business world. Not enough people are talking about this. Dude, there's so many changes now happening. And we say business world, but for the sake of our listeners here, what we're, what, what we're talking about is any real business industry, any sort of corporate environment, any sort of entrepreneurial endeavor, any sort of uh, formalized or, or professional conversation for the enhancement of industry, right? And maybe even in some classrooms and schools along the way, but but business oriented. So we're talking marketing, sales, growth, human resources. That's the angle you're, you're describing, right, Mark? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So before we get into any of that stuff, I think it's also important that everybody has a better idea who they're listening to. Uh, I think they get used to my voice a little bit and, and whatever my story is, what they may not be familiar with is yours. So I'd like to start there. Who are you, Mark? Well, that's the question we ask ourselves every day. <laughs> uh, but if I had to summarize, I am an executive leadership marketing communications consultant. And what that means is that I make a practice out of helping business leaders and organizations communicate to their public. And that takes uh, the form of everything from public relations to content and everything in between. I come from an agency background where I was an executive for a number of years and I started my own practice. So I'm also an entrepreneur trying to find my, my way in this new uncertain world. Yeah. That's it in a nutshell, at least on the professional side. Yeah, of course. Of course. Now, well, we're talking about some sort of finding your way type journey and Ovid style metamorphosis becoming the butterfly you want to be. Or I guess it was a moth in his case. But either way, the point being, <laughs> how do you start to identify which direction to go? Like in your case, in your experience, how do you identify that? Do you look at Here's the emerging tech in the industries, and let me just pursue that. Here's what's popular. Let me go that way. Here's what I'm passionate about. Let me go that way. How do you narrow it down? Because you got to start somewhere. Yeah, at least for me, it was an exercise of understanding what is important to me. And that transcends things like money, stability, or even passions. I mean, there's a lot of things that I do that are passionate that don't necessarily yield the profits that I need to survive in this world. But I think that having a greater sense of purpose about the world you live in. And it doesn't need to even be altruistic. I'm not saying necessarily that everybody needs to drop everything and join some movement or nonprofit or whatever. But what I'm doing must have some sort of positive effect on the industry that I'm serving or the world. And so for me, it isn't really about finding what's next. It's not about finding the right industry. It's not even finding about what I'm passionate about. It's like, what can I do with my skills and my interests to make either the world better, my community better, the country better? What is it that I can do to help? That's been my guiding star, you know, because I've got various skills and tools. And so, you know, what should I be using those for? 
I think that's what everybody eventually runs into. Assuming they've realized, you know, here's what I have to offer and what I can bring to the table. The next step is, well, so what? <laughs> you know, what can I do about it? How can I use it? And how can it be beneficial? And, and having that sort of vision definitely makes things a little bit simpler or at least a little bit more clear. But I, I don't think it really mitigates the complexity, right? There's a lot of changes. I mean, look, look at it now. There's this sort of hybrid industrial revolution of facts and figures and applications and almost even uh, intrinsic value to to what's happening in a business world now. You know, in the 80s, it was computers. And within the next 20 years, it was the internet. And now within the next 20 years, it's Web3 and it's crypto and this sort of, I guess we'll call it democratization of the internet, right? It's, it's like the next generation of business. It, is that influencing you at all? Is that even the direction you're considering? I think the one thing we can be certain about is that there will be uncertainty, yeah. probably for an indefinite period of time. And so the one thing that's driving me is that I cannot use legacy tools for today's problems or legacy approaches for today's problems. So I think that the posture really needs to be about sort of a dynamic posture that ebbs and flows based on what's happening with all of the change in the world. To have that dynamic posture, though, you need some sort of structure and grounding. And for me, that's purpose. Why are you doing things? What you're going to be doing is going to change dramatically no matter what. I mean, you said the next generation, the democratization of Internet. I don't know. What if that's not the case? What if it gets democratized and then seized by other, you know, profit seeking companies or, you know, who knows what's going to happen? What if there is no Internet? We really just don't know. Things are changing so rapidly that you have to find some grounding. And that grounding has got to be on what you're doing and why that's important. And this was an aha moment. The big reason I left the agency was because agencies in general, I was with a communications and marketing integrated agency. So we did all kinds of different work. But agencies in general are using tools as if it's 2012 or 2015, and they're just not working anymore. And agencies need to be more flexible in addressing the world's problems, because if they're not, they're going to get sunk. One of the byproducts of this recent surgence of information is that the consumer, the audience, whoever it is that we're talking to, they have the access to the sum total of all human knowledge at their fingertips. Alrighty, folks, sit tight. We'll be right back on Transacting Value. If you're looking for high quality, locally sourced groceries, the Keystone Farmer's Market is the place to be. Alongside our signature homemade boiled peanuts, we strive to offer only the best locally sourced pasta, baked goods, jams and jellies, farm eggs and dairy products, meats, and even seafood, as well as a great selection of fresh produce. That's the Keystone Farmer's Market at 12615 Tarpon Springs Road in Odessa, Florida. The place with the boiled peanuts. The consumer, the audience, whoever it is that we're talking to, they have the access to the sum total of all human knowledge at their fingertips. And so what is it that they're going to do to decide who to listen to? They're not going to listen to people that don't share values, and they're not going to listen to people that don't have any purpose or that are inauthentic. And so having that grounding and what it is I'm doing and why is more important than what industry am I in? What tools am I using? What business do I need to build? Because all of that comes later and that's going to change by the week in the coming years. Yeah, I agree. And I think there's a lot of that focus that we're hearing more and more about on the internet, um, reading in blogs, seeing even in video games, you know, Roblox or whatever other RPGs are out there. It's happening. You know what I mean? On YouTube, shorts or whatever social media applies, people are taking more of a vested interest at the very least in pop culture and it's permeating and it's scalable and it's influencing. Over the last 15 years, it's been growing, but the fact is that it is growing. You know, and I agree with you to what end, I'm not entirely sure, but it is either way. So you mentioned essentially a values-based mindset and authenticity sort of carrying these actions, carrying this influence. But do you find that to be more self-driven or people-driven? I find that it is more people-driven. I mean, I believe that it is important for individuals to have personal values and to personally better themselves, their environment. We're humans. We have to do that. But when it comes to purpose, it really is an external exercise. You're looking at what is it around me that I can affect for the better. And again, it's not altruistic necessarily. And when I go back to the we're humans, we're all humans are naturally pack animals. And I think in modern society, we, we look internal almost too much. 
satiate desires and needs that we have. And we're not looking out for the pack as much. And I think that that pack mentality is our natural state. And so it is important to lean into that and see what is it can I do to help the community in some way. In my case, it's pretty simple. I'm just helping business leaders with vision get out of their own way so that they can have their vision seen and their message heard. And so that automatically puts me in a position where I'm picking and choosing the people I work with because I'm not going to work with somebody that doesn't have a vision because it's not going to work for my model. My model only works if you have an authentic vision, something you're trying to do in the world. So yeah, I mean, I think that's where our heads have to be because when you're doing it that way, people who share those visions, or even if they don't share the vision, they share the, the desire for the outcome you're after, they naturally get attracted to you. And that means then you're not spending so much time, money, and energy trying to find your audience and get them to come to you or trick them to you or manipulate them to come to you. Instead, you're just being who you are, your genuine self. And then that shines brighter than the rest of the trash and the noise that's out there. So I think that's absolutely, it's got to be an external posture. You said helping, let me get this right, you said helping business leaders get out of their own way, right? To fulfill whatever yeah. visions they have, or even just ultimately create visions if they haven't yet, but helping them get out of their own way. So whether it's, I don't know, podcast syndication and licensing or overall corporate growth or enhancing or increasing an employee base or reach or scalability of a product or service. How do you advocate? How do you recommend getting out of your own way? Is there a process? Are there steps? Is it phases? Is it just one cure-all? What do you see? I wish there was a cure-all. Um, what I see is pattern and the patterns of behavior of people in leadership positions. And so I, I have an approach that I use to help business leaders get out of their own way. What I mean by that is that if you are a business leader, especially if you are in a small or medium-sized organization, you're really bound by the operations of the business. And uh, and so often business leaders become a bottleneck to growth because they have to check everything that comes through the organization. They have to have their eyes on everything. They have to control everything. And in the worst case, they're micromanaging. And one of the first phases is to kind of unshackle business leaders from their business so that they can look at their industry. Because if you're fixing problems in your industry, then you're going to fix problems in your own business as well. And that means trusting your people enough to take care of the operations of the day-to-day of the business. And business leaders tend to do manager work and they really should have managers for that. And so there's, there's a disconnect often of the internal focused business leader. If you're a COO, then yes, your focus should be internal. That's your whole job. But if you are a CEO or if you are a founder or, you know, an entrepreneur, you you have to really let go of that day to day and focus on the vision. Once you've done that, then it's a matter of building up your, what your vision is and then communicating. And that's why you have to uncouple yourself because if you're in the day to day, you don't have the bandwidth, the time, or even the perspective to step out and talk to the industry about industry problems and to to lead the industry towards positive change. The business leaders that we admire in our society are ones that have done that and they become a beacon of the industry. And so the industry just sort of follows along because that's how you innovate is you're fixing industry focused problems. I think this also works for nonprofits and other organizations, but in the business world, it's extremely important because at least in our society, it's money that talks and it's businesses that make change and it's business leaders that do it. So as, as much as we want politicians to make change, as much as we want nonprofits to make change, they often have to bow down at the feet of business and in and, and our society. And so it's important for business leaders to recognize that and to take responsibility and, and do the right thing within. They have the tools to do it. They have the influence to do it. They just need uh, to be positioned to do it. And maybe guidance, right? Like, yes. You know, it's it's tough to plan a direction or any sort of a process or, or whatever and have any semblance of flexibility or accuracy or, or whatever if you're the only one doing it because you, you only have your perspective, right? So your role as a consultant, has that been more your focus, the guide, the mentor, the advocate, or more of a manager's or from their perspective, day-to-day considerations for consultancy? It's a little bit of both, especially now. I'm still early in my consultancy on this level, especially now I find myself really integrated into an organization far more than consultants usually are, or certainly in any communications or marketing agency is. And what ends up happening is I have to integrate myself into the organization so that I can see where the processes are, who's doing them, what's going on with them. Are they aligned with goals? Is the business leader equipped, prepared, and ready to move to an external posture? 
And so it ends up happening is that I work with almost every aspect of the organization, particularly on the marketing and communication side, to make sure that they are aligned with the vision of the business leader and that they're sort of running and up on autopilot that the business leader can let go. And so that sort of integrated thing, it's, it's really, um, I think, a powerful way to do it because I essentially become a member of the team. But I have a perspective that allows the team to rally rather than having to micromanage projects. All righty, folks, sit tight. and We'll be right back on Transacting Value. There's no shortage of business podcasts with hot takes, clever insights, and tips and tricks. And here's one more. Not Another Business Podcast is hosted by corporate communications veteran Mark Havener and aims to tackle marketing and PR problems for business leaders. Now, after 20 years in marketing and communications, many of those as an executive for an integrated agency, Mark's learned firsthand what works and what doesn't. Now that we're in a new era of uncertainty, it's time to rethink the old ways of doing things. Tune in for Industry Busting Insights, a distillation of marketing speak and real-world strategies and tactics you can use in your business today. I essentially become a member of the team, but I have a perspective that allows the team to rally rather than having to micromanage projects. I like that a lot better, personally, just as a style of of working on a team. So I I can only imagine that it works well because I'm biased to it. So you're talking like, uh, what, Six Sigma type considerations, Agile and Scrum and these types of aspects is more your preferred flavor? Yeah, I I definitely tinker with that mindset. But um, many organizations, unless they're technology, are probably not used to that approach. So mostly it's about clarity and organizing what people are doing and why. But I don't have any power in the organization. So it's really about influencing change through talking to the departments, helping them with their problems, unsolving, and solving their problems, uh, and then breaking it down for the business leaders so that they can do what they need to do. But it takes time. I mean, I wish this could be like a six month program, but that, you know, many organizations are really, really structured in their day to day. And it's hard to let go. And it's hard. There's culture that you need to take into account and nurture. And there's perspectives that need to change in the executive leadership. So yeah, it's a marathon. Yeah, it definitely is. And it, it takes time, obviously, too, uh, whether it's for the sake of efficiency or effectiveness or, or whatever. You know, I heard a, it's a podcast called Work Life. Have you ever heard of it? I don't think so. Yeah. So there's a guy, I can't remember if he's a doctor or not. I'm, I'm not sure. So, you know, if you ever hear this and you are, sorry. Uh, but either way, his name's Adam Grant and he's the host of Work Life. And he's got an episode where he talks about some pitfalls in organizational culture, but as an organizational psychologist, what mental aspects come in to help make it more efficient or, or effective or just increase awareness. And one of the points that he brought up, I can't remember which episode it was, he was talking about how ultimately, to your point about vision, the founder has to identify as critically as possible and as clear as possible what their personal values are to better cultivate a corporate culture, to better influence their growth and strategy. Is there relevance to that in your experience or in your perspective? If, yeah. If the founder doesn't have an idea of what they value, then the organization has no idea what it values. And if that value is profit or you know business results, then there's no reason for a team within the organization to care, mm. you know, unless everybody's taking part in that profit sharing. And so profit is not enough of a value, you know, just the sake of the business surviving is not enough. And so, yeah, I do think that the personal value of the founder does and should feed into the organizational values. And I might end up on a tangent here, but one of the failures I see in organizations are when values are not articulated. And so if an organization, you know, steps in it online and they're now in crisis mode because they're getting blasted by social media for something that was said or done. Organizations that don't have a clear value because the founder doesn't have a clear value end up sinking in that moment because they just change their opinion about whatever is happening. So, oh, you're right. Uh, mad Internet. I'm not going to do that or, you know, whatever it is. And the reality is if you have succinctly communicated your value and that has translated into the brand value then it's much easier for you to say, I don't care what you say, internet, this is who I am. Yeah. yeah. And end it. And I think you sort of need to, to help control the flow of information too, because it can be overwhelming now with the amount of technological influence that exists, right? Peer pressure, essentially, that exists, where if you don't have some sort of corporate steadfast character or strength of personal character or whatever to stand behind, I think authenticity goes far, but superficiality goes farther faster. Yes. 
Yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. And so you, you've definitely got to be careful as a, you know, sole proprietorship, as an LLC, as a corporation or whatever other entity with any sort of digital presence, it's not going to get undone now, right? You brought up earlier as a hypothetical point, what if we don't have the internet as an actual response? I don't see it going anywhere personally. It's too inundated. It's too integrated right now. Uh, enhancements, maybe changes, likely expansion, definitely right. Efficiency for sure. Disappearance, not likely. And so because of that, you know, we've got, I mean, think about it. We've got politicians in the U S at least now, and I'm sure other countries as well made decisions 40, 50 years ago that somehow ended up on whatever version of the internet there was at the time. And now it's coming back to catch up to them when they're not even really the same people anymore. Chances are high. They aren't anyways. So imagine then what we're putting or what our kids are putting or what their generation and age group and peers are putting on the internet. What does that preclude them from 40 years from now? What does that enable them to do in 20 years? You know, how does that dictate their ability to, you know, fulfill some sort of civic role or play a role in this digital democracy? I don't know, right, wrong or indifferent. You know, if you've got a, for example, no judgment passed here, but as an example, you know, you've got politicians that are painting their faces black in the 1980s who are white that now can't run for office or lose elections. Okay, well, you know, what about people doing, I don't know, makeup videos? But you're a nine-year-old boy feeling one way now, that 35-year-old you may not be able to run for president. You know, who knows where it's going to go because of peer pressure and the ability to, to forecast that. So when you're talking about vision and when you're talking about organizational leadership and founders' personal values and strength of character, to me, at face value, that means adult. But to forecast those concepts, those constructs, how do we convey that to our kids? that sense of authority and ownership and responsibility and autonomy over your identity and your personal isms and then balance it with, okay, but the reality is you've got to maybe not conform entirely, but compromise a little to whatever society's morals are. How do you gauge that? Do you have any insight there? I don't think it's possible to set yourself up for success now for a future you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, without getting into the philosophy of what is time anyway, yeah, sure. let's just look at, uh, let's just look at what you can do. And I think at least what I tried to instill in my son who just started high school this week, you know, as, as mm -hmm. some of these big issues start hitting, as long as you are your authentic self, if you are, you know, in your heart of hearts, you know, you are doing things consistent with what you believe in, then you never have to apologize later, even if the winds change, you know, and it, I've certainly have done things in my time that were, you know, when I look back, you know, I cringe and I think, what was <laughs> I thinking? But at yeah. the time, you know, what was I authentically me? Yeah. I think at that time I was in the times that I regret, I wasn't, I yeah. was conforming to something that I was not. So yeah, there's definitely a need to balance your authentic self with society. I mean, sure. Again, we're pack animals. What's good for us and also the group. That's what we should be thinking about, uh, you know, whenever we're making a moral or ethical judgment. Yeah, you're going to have to compromise a bit for that. But as long as it's in line with your personal values and what you believe to be right and wrong and, and you have conviction around it, then you never have to apologize for who you are. And if that means you can't take public office, then that's what it means. Maybe the nature of public office needs to change. Yeah. Or conversely, maybe it's just not for you and it doesn't. But yeah, sure. I, I agree. There's sure. It really could go either way, because like you mentioned earlier, you can't accurately predict the future. Yeah. Yeah. I think we I think we as a society, especially in this country, are really preoccupied with uh, predicting the future with our business forecasts and our everything from playing the stock market to, well, even Bitcoin and digital currency is all about speculation, isn't it? How much can I resell this for? Oh, yeah. Or, you know, all the way to our extreme where we're consulting psychics and horoscopes to find our way through the day. So, you know, the present is the only thing that exists. It's the only thing you have control over. It's the only thing you have power over. You can't change the past. You can't change the future. But you can align yourself to what's important now. That present thinking, I, I would like to see more of that, especially in the business world. Yeah. Yeah. Being present in the present, uh, actively taking a role. I think that's where the majority of lessons get learned. That's where the majority of influence gets made. That's where the majority of impact happens. But there's a definite reliance on, I don't want to say future speculation, because a lot of the time that's what drives vision, right? Those types of dreams 
convert it into action, I guess. But there is a definite over-reliance on crystal balls, for sure. Yeah. Before we get too much further, though, let's take a break for a couple minutes. Uh, we'll come back. I read something of yours where you mentioned basically a, essentially a three-step approach to, to bringing people together and commonalities that I want to jump into when we get back. And also, you mentioned something about what's best for you and what's best for the group as sort of a social theory aspect of game theory that I want to jump on as well. But for right now, sit tight for a minute. And to everybody else, we'll be back on Transacting Value. Hey, y'all, it's Jules here with the Bee and the Bear Creations. We specialize in custom tumblers, T-shirts, car decals, and anything else you can think of. If you are looking to order a custom item for yourself or for someone else as a gift, please go find me on Facebook and shoot me a message and we'll get that order started for you. Again, you can find me at The Bee and the Bear Creations on Facebook. I look forward to helping you create your custom item. Alrighty, folks, welcome back to Transacting Value. Sitting here with Mark Havener. We're talking about essentially the next generation of business. These different considerations for how to focus and center your personal values, convert them into corporate values, and ensure it's people centric throughout the process. Before we get into too much more of that, though, Mark, welcome back, dude. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And all of our listeners, obviously, welcome back as well. Now, where we left off, Mark, you said something that sort of triggered me. I guess. And you, you took me back to a time and place. I'll call it 1960s Yale, I think it was. But uh, <laughs> Dr. John Nash was a mathematics teacher. And for anybody listening, if you're playing the home game, this is Russell Crowe from A Beautiful Mind. But, <laughs> but while he was there, he discovered this aspect of game theory when the scene in the bar, when he and his buddies were out trying to figure out who gets the blonde, I think was this, the setting. But you mentioned, Mark, you know, you've got to be authentic to yourself while balancing out figuring while balancing and figuring out what's best for you and what's best for everybody because we're pack animals and by nature. And that's instantly where my mind went. You've seen A Beautiful Mind? Definitely. Yeah. In fact, that movie is sort of what changed my thinking about this. And I think we might get into this a little later, but especially when I was younger, I was very individual focused and I really only thought about what I wanted and could care less about society. I mean, I'm Gen X, so I mean, I don't think that's unusual to rage against the machine. But sure. <laughs> as I got older, I mean, when I saw that movie, it kind of jogged me a bit. And uh, and then I started looking into John Nash and game theory, and it definitely started seeing things in a different way. Yeah, and, and it's crazy when you think about it, because it's not that foreign of a concept. It's just something you don't necessarily think about. Well, at least yeah. until he publicized it, I guess. Yeah, it is pretty interesting. Now, more to that point, something else you you had brought on basically in building relevance or maintaining it, I suppose, especially in the future concerning business models that, you know, you've got to identify clients and customers that have, I don't know, positions or, or visions that almost mirror or mimic your corporate values in terms of forecasting and future looking to be able to market, you know, know your audience, I guess it's no real difference than a podcast, but I think you and I discussed before, you've got sort of a three-step approach to that, uh, building that relevance. Can you dive into that a little bit? Yeah, there's only three steps, but it can take a very long time. <laughs> I wish it was a quicker <laughs> process. But the, the first step is to uh, align the organization around what I would call a vision platform. This isn't new in communications, but what is, I think, a little different given the times is that this vision platform needs to be bigger than only internal things. So it has to be bigger than profit, has to be bigger than growth, has to be bigger than a lot of the business metrics we're used to. And that vision platform often resides within the personal vision of the business leader. And once that's built out, then we align the organization around that. And that means if it doesn't fit this vision platform, we should not be doing it. If you are a member of the team and this is not a vision you share, you should not be working for this organization. Mm. If you are a member of the team and this is a vision you share, then you know you should be excited about it. And that sort of resets the clock in a way to make sure everybody's aligned around the same vision. Now, the vision can change and it will over time. But that initial alignment is what solidifies culture. And culture is paramount, especially in this business environment where the, the team is telling the business leaders where they want the culture to be. And so the best way to solve that problem of the great resignation is to make sure you are clear about what this organization's about and why. And then they can decide whether this is a place for them without having to play these games of clocking in, clocking out, micromanagement, and all the things that go in corporate culture. Sure. So that's step one. 
Step two is then to communicate that vision, which sounds simple, you know, and obvious, but it often doesn't happen because we get so wrapped up in our marketing messages that we like to talk about all of the features of our product or all of the features of our services, you know, why that might benefit you. And then we stop there. And that's how everybody talks. Why is this important though? Why is this important? And I have an example I like to use. I'm a big coffee fanatic and I actually subscribe to coffee. I'm one of those. Uh, I have, but I also have Folgers, right? And when you look at, say, Folgers versus La Colombe, which is the coffee that I like, I can't really demonstrably tell you if there's a difference in taste. Like, I think I have been tricked into believing there is, but (laughs) I don't know. I mean, coffee is coffee. It's a bitter drink, you know, and whatever. But the reason I go into La Colombe is because I know where these beans come from. And I know that uh, there are small coffee makers that are getting a share of this. And I see their story on the packaging. And I know that it's done ethically. And I know the distribution channels are clean. And you know, when I look at Folgers, I don't know anything. I look at their brand and I actually did this. I looked at the Folgers branding and their whole brand is built on legacy. Well, we've always been here. Mm. Sorry, Folgers, not enough. And I'm going to go with local home, even though it costs way more, even though the taste is probably not different. It's beyond features and benefits. Interesting. Local home has communicated their vision. And it's just an example, but I think every product and service should be thinking that way because if they don't, they're probably going to be left behind. Consumers are very sophisticated now. So that's two, communicate your vision. Folgers needs to communicate their vision. What is it? I don't know. They should know. I don't know that they know. And then the third step is to build a watering hole. Now that you have a vision platform, now that you communicated it, now you get to talk about it with other people. And, you know, this translates into everything from meetings and conferences or, you know, maybe online communities or whatever the implementation is. But the idea is that you become the place where the industry congregates to talk about important issues. Oh, I see. Because you've planted the seed. You said, this is what we should be doing. And everybody turns around and says, oh, let's talk about this. And now they're coming to you. I like to build a model in which we're not chasing the media. We're not chasing partners. We're not chasing investors. We're not chasing customers. They're just coming to us. Yeah, I track them. And that means they're the right ones. Yeah, I like that. Especially the ones that are going to align more closely with what you're trying to accomplish without you trying to solicit as much. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure that marketing is not going to die out either, right? You're going to have to spread the word. But yeah, sure. I I like that a lot. And you were talking about La Colombe. I've never heard of them or had them, but I did incidentally just get a shipment of coffee that I ordered it, what's today? So it arrived two days ago. Now I'm prefacing this because it's new to me. This, this concept isn't new, right? You find a company online, you order it, they ship your product, not a new model. What's new to me is it all happened on social media. It all happened specifically through Twitter. Quick shout out to this process because it's where my head went. And then I'll tie it back into your point. I was looking at podcasting stuff on Twitter over the last couple of weeks and finding new profiles, new, whatever things to follow, because that's sort of the new community watering hole, as I'm pretty sure even Elon Musk said it. And mm-hmm. as I'm looking around at these podcasting profiles, I find a podcasting critic, a, a reviewer of podcasts. And this particular individual and connoisseur, I guess, happened to put up on her profile this coffee shop in Buffalo called Orange Cat Coffee. And so I figured, all right, well, to build my relevance, I'll leave a couple comments here or there on podcasting stuff. I'll leave a couple comments here or there on some of the other posts and just build notoriety for transacting value. And so as I started leaving those comments, I just happened to put out there, hey, if you ever find yourself back there, put it up on your profile and then I'll order through you. You can order it while you're there. Uh, And she said, no, just go to their profile and order it. They ship. And sure enough, I went to their Twitter profile which it just so happens you have to call to to place the order. But I called, placed an order. And the next day after I placed the order, the manager called and said, hey, we just saw your order, you know, really appreciate it. Just delivery time, this shipping costs, this giving you the information, whatever. Here's why we're phone call only Uh, custom coffees. I got a butterscotch toffee coffee, light roast. I'm normally a dark roast guy, but it's it's pretty good anyway. So and then it showed up a couple days ago, right? Like I said, ordering products off the Internet is not new. It's not revolutionary anymore as it was 20 years ago. But the concept that really just rocked me was using social media for the sake of, you know, rapport and communication and conversation and just being social for business. And that model I've never paid attention to before. And I can't be one out of however many billions of people in the world that that applies to. And, you know, for every hundreds of millions, every 
whatever singular billions of people that it does apply to means there's a whole other 50% of people in the world that don't. So it's still a huge market share that isn't being taken advantage of that may very well fit into some kind of vision strategy, you know, where the, the 19 year old Twitter posters and YouTube reviewers and 16 year olds that can't get a regular job yet because of statutory legislation or whatever, there's potential out there to create your own job. You mentioned the great resignation earlier, but I mean, look at you, you're an entrepreneur starting your own job, you know, imagine yeah, if you I'm could do that. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> but imagine if you could do that at, you know, if you now, knowing what you know, could have done that when you were 15 with music industry or movies or whatever you were into, but it wasn't mowing lawns and walking dogs. It's not that anymore, you know? Yeah, it's so true. And one of the things, I love that story because it's such a good example of vision-based communications and marketing. I mean, this was classic word of mouth, but there was a structure in place. Yeah. And so there was a meaningful interaction that led to this, but they followed through on that promise of having a meaningful interaction Yeah. where they called you. It would have blown my mind if somebody from Buffalo that I ordered coffee from called me. And, you know, it's sort of like this with smart e-commerce brands. They're learning this and they're one of my clients is electric marketing and they do entirely e-commerce brands. And the smart ones are really just focusing on the value of the customer's relationship and not on acquiring new customers. And so now chances are you're probably going to go back to this place because you had that meaningful touch point. And that's where the magic happens. One of the other descriptions I get is Welsh cakes. And these are, if you've never had them, beautifully good griddled little cakes that you guests can have for breakfast. I have them for breakfast. Mm. They're like um, kind of like a scone-ish. Welsh Cake Baker. I, I met them at some sort of festival or fair and I ordered from them and they sent me a handwritten note and I get Welsh cakes from them every month now because I know they're looking at me. Well, it's, it's, it's funny you say that because a lot of these things that are happening now, these advents and revolutions and changes in, in, in business, I mean, not all of them, obviously. Uh, I can't claim that with any sort of relevance or statistic empirical data, but a handwritten note made the difference. You remember, you said Gen X, but you remember, you know, maybe late eighties, or at least for me it was, or for you when you were growing up and your parents or your grandparents or somebody said, Hey, when you get presents at Christmas, make sure you send them a thank you card. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Or like, when you, it's instilled into my DNA. I have to do that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that's, what's making the difference now between success and failure in business. You just handwrite right. a thank you card and it means everything to somebody else, you know, whereas you get a gift at Christmas now and they're like, hey, don't forget to call your cousin and say, thank you. And you're like, oh, I will, whatever, you know, <laughs> and then just stop. <laughs> right. And it's the little sort of consistent concepts when it comes to, I think, humanity and just social interaction that's going to outlast all of these changes, right? If you were to say, I say you generally, but if you were to say hypothetically, what's going to stick, what's got the most longevity, it's the reliable interactions between people that have now are no longer theories, in my opinion, right? Like manners, identifying mm -hmm. values, character development, understanding how to socialize, what your strengths and weaknesses are. Like you said, all the detailed stuff is going to change and you can't really base anything off of it. But I mean, for example, the customer service you just talked about, following up on a meaningful action for repeat business, fiduciary responsibility, whatever. I mean, that's now the differentiating factor, I think. All right, folks, sit tight. and We'll be right back on Transacting Value. Right, it's your mate Jonesy here, current host of Walkabout and occasional guest host of Transacting Value, the podcast. Driving down the road, I often think and talk to myself about life, family, education, communication, whatever. When I heard Survival Dead YT was looking for a host for this show Walkabout, I realized a change to my audience of steering wheel and dashboard would be nice. Thanks to a line in my drive time and roadworthy insights to Survival Dead YT's passion for values-based growth and character development, a YouTube Shorts version of Walkabout was born. Try to keep in mind that life is the learning experience, right? Everything will be okay in the end. So if it's not okay, then it's not the end. To learn a whole heap more road wisdom and a few different values each month, check out Walkabout by searching Survival Dead YT on YouTube. Understanding how to socialize, what your strengths and weaknesses are. Like you said, all the detailed stuff is going to change and you can't really base anything off of it. But I mean, for example, the customer service you just talked about following up on a meaningful action for repeat business, fiduciary responsibility, 
whatever. I mean, that's now the differentiating factor, I think. It's good business. And uh, it always been good business. But the difference is we've relied so much on acquisition tactics where I'm just going to buy my way into your visibility through a pop-up ad or a commercial. And later with Facebook marketing, I can completely target. Facebook marketing was highly successful for that reason. You know, yes, Facebook, I would like that keyboard that's shaped like (laughs) the spaceship. I don't know. And that sort of like impulse marketing, which has always been successful. But now because of the information age, I don't even know if we can call it that anymore. Yeah. But because of that, we don't care. I mean, yeah, I mean, if I want a spaceship keyboard, I'll go buy one. I don't need to like see an ad for that. It's interrupting my (laughs) flow. You know, the tools that we used to use are, are much more important because people aren't using it. When Apple changed their iOS on the privacy settings, uh-huh. the Facebook advertising ecosystem collapsed effectively. And now e-commerce is like, well, what now? I can't do my highly targeted messages. And I'll tell you what now. You need to be a better brand and be authentic and reach people by caring about them. That's what now. Yeah. I you, mean, can't, you can't cheat your way to the top anymore. Well, Sure. And it's sort of the irony of the more distance we're facilitating with technological innovations and efficiency and changes and upgrades and updates. And the further apart, almost, I don't know what you call that sort of a chasm. If it's not geographic, it's, I don't know, technological. People are valuing being treated as people. The more reliance there is on a technological distance. Mm-hmm. You know, it's weird. It's like functionality is being automated, convenience is being automated, but people still appreciate being treated as people, even if it's with a cartoon or an avatar or a digital representation of themselves. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. Yeah. I don't know if that's a worldwide attribution. I imagine it would be. We're all the same species, but have you seen trends internationally or is your focus primarily domestic? It's been a mix. Lately, it's been domestic, but I do have international partners and I have had worked uh, internationally quite a bit. And in general, I think the rest of the world might be ahead of the U.S. on this. On what? On creating meaningful interactions with customers and partners and being more authentic in their marketing and communications. And in some cases, blazing the trail for the next generation of e-commerce and things like that. You know, Shopify is a Canadian company. It's a good example of the antithesis to Amazon and what's going on in the e-commerce. And then in marketing and communications, I see a whole lot of disdain for the aggressive marketing tactics in the U.S. It just doesn't fly in places like Europe or Asia. Mm. So in some ways, I think that the rest of the world might be a little ahead on this. And I think that's probably because Americans in general are very, you know, (laughs) focused on ourselves. (laughs) And we're getting better, though. Yeah. I mean, and everything does over time, at least tends to over time. You know, if you if you average it out, but there's definitely some things that internationally you start to see this. I think initially in what the 80s, maybe even into the early 90s, we're talking IBM or what was the? Um, oh, it was IBM. They were talking about this sort of Kaizen model of efficiency and and moving through trying to get businesses to focus on their their products and services and their management styles and structures. But nobody, at least from what I remember hearing about or have looked at since seem to really be focusing on upward and outward leadership. It was all internal at the time. And I think now there's a, or at least over the last 40, 50 years, there's been an increased reliance on upward and outward structure and less reliance on corporate structure internally and reliance and relevance to bettering your you know, employees and your corporate value system and focusing on your internal structure. It's sort of like, as we've had in the U.S. at least, with a lot of our presidents over the last 20, 30 years even, where there's this sort of flip-flop, where one president within their four- to eight-year term will focus on domestic issues and foreign policy sort of dies down comparably. And then the next president comes in and focuses on foreign policy and their domestic agendas sort of dwindle comparably. And then it alternates back and forth up until we had most recently where Trump was more focused on domestic considerations and bettering the U.S. That was his whole, obviously, platform. And then Biden, overall, aside from COVID and a few other issues primarily, is focusing on foreign policy over domestic issues. And it sort of has gone back and forth. I think that business has done a lot of the same, just in a longer, more stretched out bell curve and cycle, where we'll focus outward, and now we focus inward, and now we focus outward, and now we focus inward. So how do you recommend, in your experience, better or more effectively balancing those two agendas 
as a business? I believe you need to do it simultaneously. And the best way to do that is to create roles and make those very clear. Roles? Roles. In a lot of organizations, the executive team pretty much handles everything. And, you know, we have to remember that the purpose of a CEO was to carry out strategy, not operations. That's the purpose of a CEO. And the CEO is not really a charge of marketing. That's what the CMO is for, just to use corporate structure. Sure. Uh, but all of those lines have blurred. And so the whole organization will look at uh, a big marketing push, for example, and then shift their focus to, oh, well, we have to take care of our internal culture. And then they'll shift the focus as, okay, what about our shareholders? And this is like, it's like the eye of Sauron, you know, moving hmm. from problem to problem. Yeah. When really that needs to be divided and conquered. Like, my role is this. I'm going to focus on creating business partnerships. Your role is this. You're going to focus on your marketing programs. Your role is to focus on that. And then just give the other, the people who are focused on those, give them the independence and the political power to do what they need to do. Business leaders tend to micromanage every division within the organization. The only thing they need to be focused on is growing the business on a macro level and communicating the message to the external and fixing the industry. That's what they should be focused on and obviously using their resources for that. But I know few business leaders that do that. Many of them like to look at the operations and everything else. They want to approve the marketing email before it goes out. And, you know, why are you doing that? That's not your role. You know, your marketing guy needs to do that. So I think we can look at everywhere. That's why you have a team. Yeah. Well, and so in dividing and conquering whatever a problem set, issue, success, achievement, whatever this applies to, I agree. I think the general platform has been you focus this, you focus this, you focus this as three individual people, to example. But from a zoomed out perspective, those three people comprising that one unit have now combined their efforts to conquer that issue. And I think that combine and conquer philosophy is, I agree, the right way to go. And then more specifically now, we're not talking primarily centralized business environments. I think the push yeah. is a little bit more greater towards decentralized. I think the more realistic end state is a distributed structure mm -hmm. for businesses. Mm -hmm. And so better identifying a process, a culture, a structure, an application, a client base, whatever, a vision to combine and conquer all of these different pieces. But to focus to your point earlier, each individual strength to the success of the group as a combined entity and then scale that based on unit in a distributed type mm -hmm. environment. I think that's ultimately where it's going to go. Now, how? I don't know in which industries first, in what future, you know, demographic or, or currency is going to make the most money. I don't know. But I think that's the platform and process that's going to, to transcend where we're at now. I think that's what's next. Alrighty, folks, sit tight. And we'll be right back on Transacting Value. Alrighty, folks, this is Porter with the Transacting Value podcast. If you're listening to this interview and you've listened to some of our others, then you already know we're playing on Spotify. You already know we're playing on iHeartRadio. Stitcher, Audius, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. What you may not have known is we're also on YouTube. So if you find yourself with the odd opportunity for some background noise or a decent conversation, or you're at work or maybe lunch, search the Transacting Value Podcast, and you can listen to all of your favorite podcast interviews as well. Now, if you have anything you want to suggest for a topic, or if you want to be interviewed, feel free to send an email to survivaldadyt at gmail.com or send a direct message on Facebook or Instagram at The Transacting Value Podcast. So, folks, from me to you, I appreciate you taking the time to listen and support the station. For different perspectives with shared values, guys, I'm Porter. I'm your host, and this is The Transacting Value Podcast. But I think that's the platform and process that's going to, to transcend where we're at now. I think that's what's next. That actually brings us to the last segment of the show, Developing character. Developing, developing character. character. Ready to play? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So we've talked an awful lot about businesses and business structure. This is more you centric. So the focus of this is three questions where question number one, we focus on the past. So how do you describe or view the values that you had as a teenager? As a teenager, I valued independence and creativity more than anything. Uh-huh. I wanted and was a creator and I wanted to have the freedom to do whatever I wanted in service to that. And, and creator, I mean, I was a writer. I designed games and things like that. And I was doing that instead of homework in school. Or, 
So because that didn't matter to me, I wasn't important. It wasn't important was that I got my creations out. Yeah. Well, I mean, said every successful person as they stand today about them then. So I think you're in a solid group of people for sure. Yeah. <laughs> All of us narcissists as teenagers. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if we're moving forward to the present, question number two, what are some of your values now that you prefer to embody or exemplify? There are a few, and I've done a lot of self-reflection during the pandemic, as I'm sure a lot of people have. Mm -hmm. But I believe in my strongest value is to create a stable society in whatever way I can. So stability, if I had to put it in one word, but not just of myself and my home, but my community, my country, my world. I want things to be, I almost said normal, but that's not the right word. I want <laughs> things to be level, uh -huh. you know, and I want playing fields to be level. I want to have stability in society. That's a big ask, man. Good luck. Yeah. But I'm sure I'm not alone in that. I mean, I'm probably feeling that way because of the last four or five years Yeah, and how tumultuous things have been. But that's definitely driving almost everything that I do. Yeah. And it's a solid direction because you're always going to have something to chase. So you really are going to avoid burnout unless you just work yourself out of it. So, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's a commendable direction to push. And while we're talking about what may happen, let's go to question three. How do you view your values changing over the next 20 years? Yeah, these are hard questions. And they may not change at all, but... I think of focus on, and this is an extension of stability, mm -hmm. but a focus on peace, not world peace, but like being able to sit on the boat in the harbor without care. Oh, sure. You know? Yeah, but not complacency. Uh, and, yeah, not complacency, but like I'm comfortable. It's like in the line in Hamilton where I'm sitting under, well, I guess it was an actual line in history, where I'm sitting under the fig tree mm. at peace with the world that I'm in. Contentment. Yeah. Yeah. That will be nice. I think some of that is obviously going to come to your earlier point from inner peace and not having anything that you really need to apologize for because you've been primarily authentic throughout your life. But yeah, ideally trying to spread that will help increase the likelihood of that sentiment for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate you answering that. Now, for anybody else that wants to get in touch with you, track down Not Another Business Podcast or reach out to you via email for consulting or, or any other number of reasons people might want to get in touch with you, how best can they do that? I think just going to my website has everything. Um, Havener.com, H-A-V-E-N-N-E-R.com. They tell me it's Dutch. I don't know. <laughs> of the Haven. So yeah, that's probably the best way to reach me. I'm on social media, not as active now as I should be, although I have a person helping me with that. We all need help. Yeah. I hired somebody and said, you have to keep me accountable. That's the problem. I don't do the things that I tell people to do. So you have to tell me to do it. Yeah. And it's working so far. You know, every great athlete needs a coach. So nobody's right. great on their own. Yeah. But okay. So if we go to your website, that gives us email access, social media, and obviously information yes. about you and your company. What about your podcast? Yep. And the podcast will be linked from there as well. Oh, easy. So everything's on there. Yeah. Everything's there. Wow. Yeah. That was simple. All right. Perfect. Well, uh, saying that then, I appreciate you taking some time out of your day so we could sit down and talk for a little while. And I appreciate your insight. Ultimately, it was a lot of topics that I think melded pretty well together. So I, I appreciate you being able to make some time, but ultimately I appreciate your perspective and being able to carry the conversation, man. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you as well. This was a really great conversation. I think more conversations like this you know, would be great. Yeah. Well, and this is where it starts. You know, like we said earlier, every little piece has to uh, start somewhere. I don't think there's ever been a successful watering hole without a well-worn path for animals to get to it. So right. what are you going to do, right. you know? But all things considered, thank you to everybody listening for listening into our core values for October of vision, authenticity, and responsibility. Also, thank you to, as we had mentioned earlier, Adam Grant from the Work Life Podcast. Russell Crowe, if you ever hear this, thanks for being in a beautiful mind, but ultimately <laughs> John Nash. Uh, Lock Alone Coffee, we talked about Orange Cat Coffee, obviously Electric Marketing, Welsh Cake Bakery. Thank you guys for your inspiration and all the experience, Mark, that you've been relying on to pull into this as well. Uh, but to our show partners, Keystone Farmers Market, the Bee and the Bear Creations, and obviously Anchor for your distribution as well. Now, if you're interested in joining our conversation or want to discover our other interviews, check out transactingvaluepodcast.com. And remember, you can follow along on social media too, while we continue to stream new interviews every Monday at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on all your favorite podcasting platforms. 
So until next time, that was Transacting Value. Thank you.